Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! This weekend, it will be 10 years since the collapse of Lehman Brothers Bank, a key moment in the unfolding of the global financial crisis. In the period that followed, share prices plunged, the banking system teetered, and millions lost their jobs. The impact can be seen even today. Research carried out for the BBC has shown that real annual wages are £800 lower than they were a decade ago. Our economics editor, Kamal Ahmed, reports. You call the financial crisis, you're totally oblivious to it when you're in it. All I was trying to do is make sure there's food on the table, got water, you got heating. Just happy to be in work. Earl Martin from Manchester. Like so many people, unaware events thousands of miles away would still matter now. Lehman Brothers, America's fourth largest investment bank, goes bankrupt. This is a once in a century type of event. Looking back now with his son. Have you noticed any like big changes in the last 10 years? Um, yeah, financially loads, economically loads, the recession, massive slump. We are slowly, 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 people say, getting out of it. I'm only just getting to the point where I was 10 years ago. But with cost of living, I'm actually still on a loser. What is remarkable is the long-term effects of this crisis. Let's look at a household like Earl's. If wages growth had continued as it did before the financial crisis, how much better off would the average household be? How about £4,246? And growth has been stuttering as well. The economy now, 16% smaller than it would have been without the financial crisis. I spoke to a former Treasury advisor about what needed to be done. I think some of the reasons that we aren't seeing this robust rage growth, these great quality jobs, is because we aren't seeing the skills coming out of our schools and universities in the way that we should. And I think, therefore, when we're rethinking how we consider economics, how we consider policy, much more emphasis should be placed back on strong government policy and how we build in long-term government incentives. And here's the man responsible for that, the Chancellor. Ten years on from the financial crisis, government debts, £1.8 trillion, pounds. people's real incomes hardly moved over a decade, public services facing cuts. Your government, previous governments, really, frankly, haven't been very good at dealing with the terrible economic consequences of that financial crisis. That's a shock from which people are still uh, suffering the effects today. As you say, a decade of stagnation uh, in real wages, um, uh, causing uh, problems for people's standards of living, and we're very acutely conscious of that. But look, we have got through this in much better shape than many of our neighbours. We haven't suffered catastrophic rises of unemployment. On the contrary, we've seen uh, employment grow by three million uh, jobs. Mr Hammond said there was light at the end of the tunnel and wage growth is returning. But there's a long way to go before people like Earl Marchand feel more positive. Kamal Ahmed, BBC News. Free-to-use cash machines are disappearing at a record rate because we're using less cash and because they're increasingly expensive to run. There are currently around 53,000 free cash machines in the UK, but more than 250 are disappearing every month. There are worries that the closures could leave people, particularly in rural areas, without access to cash. Sean Lloyd reports from the Vale of Glamorgan. St Athan in the rural Vale of Glamorgan. People living here are charged to use the two cash points in the village. Locals range from the elderly to young families. Not being able to visit a free cash point is seen as a problem by many. It's horrible. And to think that you have to make sure you've got the extra two quid in your bank to be able to redraw just ten pound, that's stressful on its own because if you haven't got it, then you're stuck. I'm not paying to get my own money out of the bank. I'd rather go and borrow ten pounds and pay to get my money out. You know, I use contactless more than pull money out, which is an easier option. But it would be a lot easier if there were more cash points around the area. 
It's a different picture in city centres where there's often lots of choice. The organisation which coordinates the cash point network, called Link, believes there are too many in some towns and cities as demand for cash is falling with a rise in contactless payments. But in less populated areas, machine operators say cash points are not so economically viable. Link says it has identified more than 2,000 free-to-use machines in remote areas that it wants to ensure stay open. It believes one of the answers could be to give incentives to operators to install free-to-use cash machines in rural communities like this one, where there's currently a lack of provision. The industry regulator has been monitoring. We are concerned to hear that some communities have lost their free-to-use ATM. That's why we're taking strong regulatory action now to put rules in place on Link to make sure it's doing everything it can to put those back in place. Many people do still depend on cash for paying for their shopping and bills. Without action, it's feared that communities like this one may see more closures. Sean Lloyd, BBC News, St Athen. Well, here, the Archbishop of Canterbury received a standing ovation today as he attacked the government's benefit system and big businesses for leeching off the public. Justin Welby told delegates at the Trades Union Congress that the rollout of universal credit should be halted because it left people worse off. Well, our business editor Joel Hills is here. It's pretty extraordinary, this, isn't it, from the Archbishop? What a speech. He was addressing Britain's biggest unions. Union membership, MR, is in decline. But the Archbishop said that the unions play a vital role today, protecting workers from exploitation and corruption. That went down well, but it was what he had to say, his savage criticism of big companies that drew the biggest applause. He accused Amazon of getting away with paying almost nothing in tax. The Archbishop said he was pleased that Wonga, the payday lender, had gone bust and described the gig economy and zero-hour contracts as the reincarnation of an ancient evil. He was also deeply critical of the government's universal credit system designed to simplify and make the uh, benefit system more efficient. He said it was causing hardship. If the government can't get it right, he said, it should stop rolling it out. We know that it has left too many people worse off than they were, putting people at the heightened risk of hunger. Can you believe we say this in England in the 21st century? Heightened risk of hunger. When universal credit comes into a local area, the need for food banks goes up very significantly. Mary, in a statement tonight, the Department for Work and Pensions says it's wrong to link the use of food banks to any one cause. Amazon says it pays all the tax in the UK that it should do by law. Deliveroo and Uber, two companies widely associated with the gig economy, said they didn't want to comment on the Archbishop's speech, a speech which is not easily dismissed. His voice carries. Mm, it certainly does. Joel, thank you very much. £15 million pounds in cuts to public services, from youth services to gritting the roads. Amid noisy protests outside, councillors in Somerset have voted to slash spending over the next two years, declaring the authority had a duty to live within our means. Councillors blamed cuts on government funding and warned if they didn't make the sweeping cuts by March, the consequences would be horrendous. From Taunton, Anya Pop reports. It's a little after 9am in Taunton. A small group of protesters gather ahead of Somerset County Council's decision on £15 million worth of cuts that they say are needed to keep the council afloat. Uh, so good morning to everybody. The council's cabinet is considering more than 70 proposals that range from reducing winter gritting routes to cuts to support for children and young people. Somerset is the latest council to have to there cut major no services while it grapples with an increase in demand and less money from central government. It is, though, the most difficult set of decisions that we will ever have to consider. And it is the most difficult because all the low-hanging fruit, as I've said elsewhere, has been taken and we really are now getting down to some very difficult areas. The building was packed with members of the public in a last-ditch attempt to save support systems they've come to rely on. One of those is Get Set, an early intervention service which supports vulnerable children and parents. About a third of our families rely on the input and support from Get Set, so who are they going to turn to without them there? Do you accept, though, that the council are in a position where they have to make cuts somewhere? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this whole country is in a bit of a mess at the minute, isn't it? And we do need to save money and look to the future. I get all that. However, I just think young children um, need the input now, which will save money in the long term. This is the wrong place to make cuts, I think. It's, you've got to think of the mental health as well as everything else for the mums. And as much, they need as much support as they can. 
especially someone like me as well. We need all the support and that's why we're here today to try and get that support back. Going to the group helps. Like, um, I went to the group on Monday and it was lovely. And if I can't have that support, then I don't have anything, so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Georgie and Brooke met at a support group for young mums run by Get Set. They say it's been a lifeline for them. It's more than likely that the um, group's going to end up not happening in a few weeks. And to us, that's really bad because we need the support. And young mums, like compared to some people, they've got a lot going on. And to be able to have that group is amazing. And for that to be taken, it's not going to be good for us. It's just really upsetting to know these people who actually care about us are losing their jobs and we are losing their support. Somerset's financial woes come on the heels of another crisis hit Tory run council. Northamptonshire County Council became the first local authority in two decades to issue a section 114 notice earlier this year, meaning it was effectively bankrupt. Critics say Somerset chose not to raise council tax at a time when most others did and that they've rushed these cuts through with little consultation. But there's no doubt local councils in England have borne the brunt of austerity with huge cuts in funding from central government. You're obviously a Conservative council and the government is a Conservative party. Do you feel hung out to dry by them? I feel abandoned. I feel abandoned that uh, we are having to sort all these issues out. Uh, we've constantly made ass of uh, not only of our own MPs but of our government and I'm afraid there is no solutions coming. And I accept that. I accept that that's uh, what, the, what, the, what the current agenda is but I still have to provide services to people in Somerset and therefore I have to cut my cloth accordingly. Almost all of the suggested cuts were passed today with more on the horizon next year. But with financial pressure on councils across England becoming ever more apparent, calls for the government to act may increase too. And your pop reporting. Uh, but now we have Owen Jones in The Guardian, who's going to take us through not only his own column in The Guardian, but also other columns. First of all, Owen, your column in The Guardian, poorer communities were pummeled by Thatcherite industrialisation. Now another Tory government is wreaking more social chaos. What's the thrust of the piece? So local government's been particularly decimated by Tory austerity. In fact, nearly half the central government grant whoosh has gone since 2010. But it's the poorest communities that suffer the most. So a new report finds that almost all the spending on disadvantaged people, 97%, uh, has been in the poorest fifth communities. Now, these are places that have suffered from Tory deindustrialisation uh, and under New Labour as well, uh, but also uh, from the worst effects of austerity. So take Salford. Uh, Salford, where they've lost about 700 quid per household in terms of funding. Homelessness has gone up by 600%. They've got lots of younger people going into care, which has surged across the country, again, particularly in the poorest communities. So what we've ended up with the situation is those most in need have suffered the worst fall in resources, and that's having a catastrophic consequence on, on, on the lives of those who are most vulnerable. And I have to say, the media has failed to give that the scrutiny it deserves. One of the things you're suggesting is, and as it were, the redist redistribution of business rates to try and sort a lot of this out. Well, the danger is we'll move towards a system where uh, you get local authorities that get to keep their business rates, uh, if you like, uh, but what you'll end up there is a beggar thy neighbour situation where they'll compete on slashing business rates, but also who will get the most business rates yeah. if you take away the redistributive mechanism, the wealthiest areas. So if you take, if you compare Newcastle to Leafy Essex, well, of course, those councils in Leafy Essex will be able to get far more revenue than some of those poorest communities. 